Good evening. On behalf of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, we welcome you um, to this evening's uh, film and talk with Tom Shadiak, who, as many of you know, is one of Hollywood's um, most celebrated comedy director. He's done films like Liar, Liar, The Nutty Professor, and Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. And uh, in, this, in this documentary, he explores, um, I believe, the meaning of life in greater depth, but we'll see more of that. And at the end, we'll have an opportunity to speak directly to Tom, so if you have questions for him, you can, you'll be able to ask them directly. Um, he'll be joining us for that part. So I hope you all enjoy tonight's session, and apparently all I need to do is press play. Hello, test. Okay, good. I was going to say plastic, not good. <laughs> not good. Okay, what's up? I'm going to come down. Who the hell are you people? <laughs> I, uh, I just flew in, and there's a room full of people of all ages. Wonderful. I love this mix. Fantastic. What a great mix. How many are students here? Okay. And how many are students in life? Ah, fantastic, beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. So I take it um, all from the Stanford community and, and area, yes? Good. Um, anything else happening tonight? Oh yeah, baseball game. <laughs> Harold, what's the score? Just so I can keep them posted. I, I really, it's zero, 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 look at that. He's on, you were on your cell phone <laughs> during the movie. No, it's all good, zero, zero. So just hang in there. Harold will give us updates in the back. A one zero, who's up? The Giants, okay, so it's good. Okay. Just to reaffirm the fact that we're not competitive in our nature. Hell yeah, the Giants are up. Fantastic. Right. To hell with those Detroit people, yeah. All right, let's talk about love. Okay, here we go. All right, so look, let's just, what do you want to talk about? Whatever you want to talk about, let's talk about. I, you know, I could hit you guys a number of ways, but this is what I generally call the choir, because this is CK, right? It's all about compassion and altruism, right? This is a very alive and aware group. So, so let's see if we can get spicy, though, tonight. So what do you got? You have a hand up. What's your name, brother? Kevin. Kevin. Everybody say hi to Kevin. Hi. Kevin, the score is one to nothing. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, Kevin wants to know what insight can I give him, uh, students that are living this real student life and then going out into the real world, right? Uh, uh, th my insight is, is uh, the student life isn't necessarily the real world, and the real world isn't necessarily the real world. The world that they've crafted at universities generally, and again, I don't know every university, is not necessarily, quote unquote, the real world. And then they give you a degree and say, you're going out into the real world. Okay, first of all, all of life is real, right? These young children who are experiencing things for the first time, that's real too. So this idea that you go out into the real world is an illusion, it's a story we tell ourselves, understand it's a story, okay? It's a story. So the world we've created at universities is this competition, right? You're under a grading system, right? That system, 100 years from now, is going to be looked at as a kind of slavery of our youth, the categorization of what cannot be categorized, right? The standardization of what cannot be standardized, so understand that, right? This stratification, this idea that, that there are certain classes that you need to take to get a degree and all this kind of way that we educate this drilling in instead of drawing out. It's all going to be reinvented. 
So understand that, okay? That's why I asked, how many of you are students of life? You're a student for the rest of your life, Kevin. So this just happens to be the way society is structured. You've got four years, you're gonna go, you're gonna live with a whole bunch of people your age, which is kind of nutty. It's not done in nature. We stick you all like in thousands of people together in groups. And you don't have necessarily the influence, the balance of different age groups, different experiences. I teach a class, I teach several classes in LA. Last night I had a class of 400 at Pepperdine University and my classes are like this. There's people from the community, there's people doing work in the world, there's people that are retired, there's people that are young and starting out. And that mix of energy is a different kind of education. That's what I would call life. So just understand that what you are in right now is a social vision and you're gonna have to see through it to your own authentic self and path. Understand that. It is, and what you see is one way of looking at the world. And it's going to be reinvented because your generation is going to reinvent it. I'm very passionate about this stuff. How many of you think education needs to be rethought? Okay, many of us, many of us. And I hear this on the radio all the time. Just we need more money for education. We do not need more money for education without a philosophy that undergirds education that is no longer going to have our kids going into schools and shooting each other and bullying each other. Those grow out of a toxic root of overcompetition. This idea that we're celebrating tonight because the Giants may win is actually beautiful. But the problem is we've attached something that's toxic in our society to the winner belongs the spoils. And that's what you're taught, Kevin. If you don't win, you're going to lose and you're going to starve. Your kids aren't going to eat. You're not going to have a path and it's not going to be your world. It's going to be the winner's world. And that's exactly why we have the world that we have. We're not brothers and sisters. You don't do this with your children. You don't say, are you guys sisters? They're sisters, right? And you don't say, if you go do well in school, what's her name? You're, you're Ella. No, this is Ella. And what's your name? Isabel and Ella. So if Isabel does well, Ella, you're going to starve. <laughs> Ella, when you need medicine, I'm sorry. You're not going to get medicine. Right? Would any father do that to their child? No, because they're a family. At what point does the human family stop being a family? Right? At what point does the human family stop being a family? And we now know that we all share the same DNA from the same two parents in sub-Saharan Africa. We know this as scientific fact. We've traced the DNA back, the human genome study. These very simple ideas that these saints and sages have come along and told us we're either going to wake up to or we are going to die off. Sorry, Ella. Very sorry. But Isabel was kicking your butt anyway. <laughs> And it was not looking good for you. You know I'm kidding, right? Okay, right. But see, society isn't kidding. All right, Kevin, hang on. You want to you follow up? A quick follow-up, because I just gave you like a 30 freaking minute answer. We got no time left. <laughs> The question is not, do I find it ironic? Yeah. yeah, the question is not, do I find it ironic? Do you guys find it ironic, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But that conversation, I hope it happens here. It doesn't happen very often. You don't see it on television when there's a, when there's a bullying incident, you know, when there's a school shooting, when there's a, a, a shooting at a movie theater. When these things happen, we don't talk about the root of why they happen. So... If you understand already the irony, then you're beginning to talk about the root cause of this. There's an ideology, there's a reason these things are showing up in our culture, right? They didn't show up in many indigenous cultures because they were humming to a different story, right? They did a lot of things that we don't want to emulate, a lot of things that we, wouldn't, that we have moved beyond, right? And especially in terms of creativity and technologies, we've moved in a different direction. But the ideology of cooperation. The fastest rider in an indigenous culture didn't get all the stuff, right? It was like, wow, you're the fastest rider. What's for dinner, right? Wow, you can build huts like nobody. What else is new? In our society, that to the winner belongs the spoils is a toxic ideology. I was a winner. I got the spoils. I had to see through that and see that is, that is poison. 
I got co-opted into a cancerous ideology that is the competitive rooting of the school system now. We've only done this for a few hundred years, by the way. The human species has been alive for 175,000 years, educating itself in very natural ways, right? But now we figured, no, we have to isolate education out so we can, parents can go and earn a living. We'll isolate. The most important thing we can do is educate each other, not just our kids, but each other. But we isolate that out so we can go earn a living and create this system that is broken. And one more thing, I love teachers, by the way. I think teachers are the most amazing people, give their lives to education. Many teachers understand this and want to reinvent things. Yes, in the back. What do you mean, where is the room for a paradigm shift? Like, this room. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What's your name? Ben. ben. Some people may think on that scale. I certainly do not. I think about the paradigm shift in my own life. And then I try to create a circle of influence around me that scientific. I may influence one or two people here tonight and they'll influence others. And then someday China may see that we're doing, enough of us are doing things different. What a great time for America to lead, right? To say, hey, we've been down that road. You can go down that road of materialism, but we've got a lot of studies now and a lot of experience to say it doesn't work, so we're moving this way. We're moving into the, into the area of serving each other with respect for all of life. So you guys keep kicking butt your way. We're going this way, right? So all paradigm shifts come from here. And I get tripped up when I think, how do I change China? How the heck do I change China? <laughs> right? Jesus had a hard time just getting the inner circle around him to understand what he was talking about. <laughs> right? Right? But in, 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 in staying inside of his own life and story, right, which again spread beautifully throughout the world, right, there was an energy, an authenticity, right? The Greeks become the Greeks by staying home. Right? We think we gotta, I got to go run to these people and tell them how to live. I got to run to these people. Let's us learn how to live. Let's us beam with energy and light and love. As Emerson said, let's sweep floors and mop and pick up brooms so that we'll make all others in the world want to sweep and mop floors. Let's live with that kind of energy. Amen, brother. Hallelujah. <laughs> Harold, what's the score? Is it still 1-0? Okay, okay. We think it's still 1-0. All right, all right. Yes, in the back. What do you think self-love has to do with it, and how do you practice self-love? How do I practice self-love? Well, let's turn the lights out. <laughs> let's turn them down. Let's light a candle. First, I look in the mirror, and I say, you're not bad. <laughs> uh, self-love, yeah, that's this idea that it's a sort of a term. Um, I think if you understand reality, you can't help but love yourself. And that's not in a small s way because you understand that you are a part of something larger, right? When Emerson wrote self-reliance, he wasn't talking about it with a small s, right? So when I say, wow, I'm on a journey and I've learned some things and, and, and I understand who I am, I understand that inside of me, is the eternal flame, right? Inside of me, where did Jesus say the kingdom of heaven is? Right here, you look for it there, you look for it there. It's no, but the kingdom of heaven is within you. Once you understand that, that the story ends well for all of us, ooh, there's something we could talk about. The story ends well for all of us. You can't not help but, so I sit inside of truth. As much as I can, I try to bathe myself in truth because, Kevin, what you go through is you go through life and you, you see what I call half-truths or untruths, right? You got to buy this, you got to buy that. You got to get this grade, you got to do that. If you don't do this, you're not going to be and you can't and you got to be somebody. Who are you going to be when you grow up? All that stuff we're going to do when you enter the real world, that's all half-truths, if any truth. I try to sit inside a truth, whether it's a walk in nature, the poetry of Hafez, uh, an Emerson essay, a line from a saint or sage that lights up my soul, a conversation with someone that's real. And then all that quote unquote self-esteem, oh, it just becomes so expansive. Right? 
that I just can't stand that line, you know, even a, a waitress, or a wait, excuse me, forgive me, waitress, a, a hostess said it to her, and like, what do you call them now, stewards? Uh, she said, you've got to make sure, she was teaching a young person like Isabel, you've got to put your oxygen mask on first, right, before you help another. And, and I, I just see things very differently. So I say, first of all, determine how much air you have. And if you have enough air and the person beside you is dying, put theirs on first, right? So, so many of us have so many resources right now and the person beside us is dying, but we're told by our culture, no, take care of yourself first. And then you can put the oxygen mask on someone else. That someone else is me. That someone else is simply a mere reflection of divine energy that is me, right? All things being one, every major mystic, religious saint or sage said the same thing. I got to take my sweater off. I'm getting hot. <laughs> I see you online, Harold. What's the score? Let's keep these people posted. <laughs> Two to nothing. Ninth Two to nothing, ninth inning. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's keep, okay, this is good. Let's, should we send them some love? All right, what else you freaks got? Come on, come on, hit me. Yes, yes. What plans do I have for the movie? Um, uh, giving it away as freely as I can to the whole flipping world, right? We're in a, releasing it internationally. It's been released here. I mean, we've been on Oprah and Ellen and et cetera, and we just want people to see it. So we give it away freely. Uh, you know, any money we, quote, make from the movie goes back to the common good, we've freed villages of slaves, we've worked with, no, that's actually true. I mean, I know it sounds like a joke, but there are actually 27 million slaves in the world today. And so we use the funds to work with an organization called Free the Slaves and we've freed villages of slaves. So we're, so, we're so trained to think that we ended slavery in 1865, but see Kevin, the mentality that creates slavery is still very alive. And you're inside of it right now. And we don't realize that we're inside of the mentality that creates slavery. It is the commoditization of everything, right? I can make a profit off of you, right? And I can make a lot off of you, right? Even if I'm a doctor, say, or an educator, or an artist, I can make a profit off of you. So slavery is simply where a doctor may commoditize the spleen if I'm going to do an operation. I can commoditize the whole body. It's just the same. It's an, it's an aberration out of the same toxic root, but it's still from a root. So anyway, we just want to, what we do now is give our art away and hope that it touches people. And if not, we're going to rock on, right? How's that coloring book? Good? <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, you know, there's only so much you can take from a guy up here. Looks like Jesus at 50. I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> Yes, Dad. Uh, I am too. I am too. I am too. You are also. Yes. We, no. I am, we are. Yes. Yes. Are we going to do I am too? Yes, it's going to be 3D. It's going to involve a fish, talking fish. No. No. Um, um, Harold, how's the game? 2-0. We're good. Um, yes. And, and in fact, I'm going to test it out tomorrow because I think the one thing there's one idea, and Einstein saw this as well, that because nobody in the world is going to say, yes, we need to, nobody's going to disagree if you say we need to be more loving with each other. Nobody's going to disagree, right? The basic ideologies in this movie, people are going to say, absolutely, we must love each other. We're brothers and sisters. All things are one. But that's not real. And how does it walk in the real world? Meaning, how do we do business with each other? It's really all about business with each other, right? And that's the movie that I think I may want to make. So I'm, I'm meeting with a group of business students tomorrow to test out an idea. I think it all comes down to the economy. And I spell it economy. We need an economy. We, we have an economy. <laughs> right? And, 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 and I think it all comes down to that. Because everyone that objects to my ideas just says I'm Pollyanna and that it doesn't work in the real world. And I say... What's happening isn't working because it's not real. 
It's been created. It's not how nature works. It's not how life thrives, how biological systems thrive in the long run. It's through cooperation in every case. When they get overly competitive, they die off or they adjust their behavior to become more cooperative. That's the history of single cells, etc. It's a history of nature. But they've had four, nature's had 4 billion years to work it out. We're 175,000 years old. We're here on the evolutionary scale. And we're at a point now where we're talking to each other. When you see systems that communicate at a much more effective and efficient rate, that means it's time to reach a new level of awareness. So we're either going to reach that level or we're going to go the fate of many civilizations before us and we're going to die off. I know this is very heavy, girls. <laughs> All right. And look, and she has a, can I show them? And what I just said is weird but true. <laughs> It's weird but true. You find one weird but true fact in here. We're going to share it later, okay? I want to know what's weird but true. Okay. Uh, yes, in the back. All the way in the back, sir. In the, in the, yes. It's good and loud. I remember I've had a concussion. I'm coming up because you're, you're a soft-spoken bastard. Yes. <laughs> what? Yes. How do you stay there? You keep losing it. Yes. Yes. What's your name? Swath? Beautiful. Um, so Swath has a really... Uh, uh, it's a common challenge that we all face. And he's basically saying he has moments where he feels the connection. He feels love with all things, you, everyone. Um, and then he loses it. He gets back to what he calls his normal life and he loses it. So, Swaf, how do you stay healthy? And I mean physically healthy. How do you stay healthy? You eat right, right? Maybe you work out or you do something that you enjoy, biking, hiking in nature, running, whatever you enjoy, surfing, right? You, you stay involved in the thing that makes you healthy. That's how you do it, right? That's how you do it. So if, if, if I have any uh, uh, more consistent, if you will, awareness, uh, any more consistent feelings of love than I had when I started this, it's because my life now has become this. So I leave this conversation with you. Guess where I go? I go and have a conversation with Harold, my friend, about this. I get on my emails to talk to my friends about this. I have students that I meet with, and we talk about this. And I wake up in the morning, and I read the, those poems by Hafez or Rumi or Rainer Maria Rilke or, or, or a mystic uh, thought from St. Francis, etc., cetera, or, 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 or Buddha or Siddhartha. I stay inside of it, and it stays here, right? That's how you do it. It's no trick. You are what you eat, right? But don't think and don't judge yourself because it's difficult because the world that we're in challenges us. You already understand that challenge, so start tipping your scale more toward ex the expansion of your heart. One step at a time. Yes, my brother, hand up strong in the back. In the world of need and greed, how do you define what love is or unconditional love is? Well, the difference between this love can be used as a commodity. Like someone says, you will do this for me if you love me. Yes. But we should do it unconditionally. Yes. So you've answered your own question. <laughs> well, you've just answered your own question. Love, has, love is its own reward, right? The consequence is sown in the deed. So if you love someone and truly reach out to them in a moment of compassion, that's the reward. You don't need them to say, you're the most awesome cat in the world, now I'm going to do something for you. Inside of that action is already the elevation of the soul. It is already, the, the oxytocin's already being released, right? So if you're looking for a result, 
follow her out. We're going to see where she's going. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Whew. Number one or number two? Just so we know. Just, just curious. I am a teacher. Oh, she's a teacher. She's got to go. She's got papers to grade. She, no. I love her. I don't know where she's going. God bless. I, listen, and you already know this because inside of your question was, was a beautiful statement. So, all right. Yes, my brother, my hugging brother. Yes. You are horny. <laughs> this man is horny. He says we intellectualize all these deals. Why don't we, when we come to these things, why don't we just hug three strangers? And, and I jest with you, but it's true. Yeah, we talk about things a lot. But I'll tell you what, we'll hug it out. You want to hug it out? Well, give us a minute. Let us intellectualize for another minute. <laughs> and then we're going to have a moment where we'll suspend the, the uh, uh, harassment rules around here. We'll have a, three minutes of inappropriate behavior. <laughs> all right? We'll get a hall pass. <laughs> Emma just went, holy hell, I'm never going to be able to invite Tom back again. Yes, 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 in the back. You, that's you. Yes. Yes. Is there a place that we divide it? Have you figured out where that is and what it is? Yes. Yes. And your name is? Bruce. Bruce is Bruce. I made a movie about you. Bruce <laughs> Almighty, right there. Bruce Almighty. Uh, and Bruce, that was an Almighty question because that is really, that's a really essential question. Because are we naturally like this? Have we always been like this? Or was there a point in history where we made a choice and we started diverting and creating this I idea? And no, I certainly didn't come up with it, but I began to recognize it as others have recognized it. That point in our history is the invention of agriculture. So for 165,000 years, this human species, we're going to say, because it's arguable, let's call it 175,000 year history, for 165,000 of those years, we were hunters and gatherers, right? So that hunter and gathering lifestyle did not allow us to store food. We had to always depend on nature, and we had to depend more on each other, even other tribes. And again, there was some very violent Encounters with tribes, but it was always over land. It was never, we're going to go wipe out those people because they don't think like we think. So there was this interdependence on life because if life, nature did not provide for you, you didn't eat, right? There was no slavery, no slavery inside of that ideology for 165,000 years. What good would it do to, to bring a slave along? They would just have to be fed as well as we all look for food. There was no reason. Agriculture comes along. And it doesn't come along because we're bad, because we're creative, we're curious, right? And we solve one of our problems, but we create another problem, which is we can store food. This is why the mystics come along and say, don't even store into barns. Don't even care and concern yourself with tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough cares of its own, right? Do not store into barns is one of the basic tenets of the wisdom teachings, right? So what happens when we start storing? Well, we get a lot of stuff. We lock up food. Now we can, specialization emerges, right? So a few of us have the food covered, so you guys can build huts because you're good at that. You guys can hunt. You're good at that. You guys can maybe be the mystics of the group. You're good at that, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but then we start taking the food, which you've never done, and locking it up, right? And saying, well, if you don't build the huts right, you don't get into the food. If, you don't, if you're not a good mystic, you're not going to get into the food, and if you don't do your thing, you're not going to get into the food. We start locking it up. And then some store more than others for themselves. And so envy gets created. It all roots back to this idea of agriculture. And agriculture is not bad. It's simply the ideology that got co-opted. And we're trying this branch out. We're just like nature. We're trying something out. It feels kind of nice, right? If I had a lot of stuff, I have some things I'm happy. Maybe if I have a lot of things, I'll be even more happy and secure. But we're finding out that that's not true. So these saints and sages and mystics know, trust, there's some kind of intelligence that put us all here. Trust that. Trust that. It will provide. Understand the laws of life, our cooperation, our love, our compassion, our empathy. That's how you will thrive. Understand that. 
It might make you less secure in the long run in your mind, but your heart knows you will be provided for. But we come up with insurance policies. Insurance policies grow out of agriculture, right? It's just the storage of stuff forever. <laughs> Nothing's ever going to happen to you. Nothing in nature has an insurance policy. Nothing in nature is insured against problems. Everything is potentially in any moment open and vulnerable to other life. We try to break that rule. So that's where it started. I hope I made myself clear. I'm very passionate about it because I certainly didn't understand that for most of my life. I just thought we were always greedy, always selfish, always aggressive, and always violent. But that greed, which was always in us, we have the capacity, got intensified when we were bouncing off of a greedy ideology, which is storage itself. Right? We can clear this plot of land. Let's clear another plot of land. All the environmental crisis comes out of that idea. Right? And so the environmental crisis in the physical world is just a reflection of the environment we've created with each other. That's another crisis. Hey, don't touch my shit. That's my shit I got stored. Don't touch it. Right? This is a, an, an Emerson quote that I love. Men such as they are seek money or power. That's storage. Men such as they are seek money or power. And why not? For they aspire to the highest. And this in their sleepwalking they dream is the highest. Wake them. Wake them and they shall quit the false good and leap to the true. Right? The idea of the mine, mine, mine is what we have to rethink. Because there is no mine. Right? When we plunder the earth for metal, what do we call it? Mine. Right? That's got to be rethought. Any facts? Okay, what do you got? Let's see. Holy goodness. This is a strange fact. Some ants make themselves explode when attacked. <laughs> Interestingly, this is also true of some Republicans. So, uh, <laughs> just kidding. I, that's a wonderful fact. Maybe there's another one. Yes, my dear. Tell them that fact. This is a crazy fact. You're not going to even believe this. When you eat too many carrots, you turn orange. <laughs> when you eat too many carrots, you actually begin to get orange. Isn't that true? Yeah, it happened to you. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Maybe that could be your Halloween costume. Just eat a whole boatload of carrots <laughs> and then go out and they'll say, oh, my gosh, she's got orange makeup. All right, maybe not. All right, a few more questions and then how'd the game go? Is it over? Congratulations. You've kicked the hell out of Detroit. Don't worry about the fact that they have fewer jobs than you now and they're suffering. <laughs> but you've got another notch on your bedpost. Congratulations. Yes, and then we'll come down here. Yes. Um, how do you cultivate compassion in the online world? You bring compassion to your technology. I have a very radical belief about technology. I, I think it's a great illusion that technology is good. It's neutral. Because we know technology can be used to hate and harass. Facebook can be used to bully. If you've ever been on the internet, you know that there's some very, very hateful messaging because you're already disconnected from me. I can't see you, so it's nothing for me to call you a name. Right? So it can be used to harass and bully, and it can be used for love and, and, and spreading uh, beauty throughout the world. So you bring the value to technology. That's how technology becomes what it can be. You bring the value to technology. So don't have a conversation about whether technology is good or not. Have a conversation about whether you're bringing a beautiful value to technology. It's the wrong conversation. The conversation is here. The conversation we need to have is here. Here. Who are we? What do we value? Everything you see in the world is an outgrowth of the value system that we now subscribe to. It is no accident. The world is not unjust. The world is perfectly just. Everything you see is a just fruit of how we treat each other and nature. Right? There are laws in place. Gandhi knew it. Martin Luther King knew it. Morality is not some woo-woo idea. Morality is actually a reflection of how life works. Right? I am my brother and my brother is me. Right? I can't be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. 
Because if you're not what you ought to be, I'm going to walk down the street and my two girls are going to walk down the street and we might get robbed because you're hungry. I can't be fully free until you're fully free. We are tied in a web of mutuality. That's the physical fact that Martin Luther King saw. And we think it's a sermon and a high and mighty idea and it is reality at its most fundamental. If these guys preached some Pollyanna idea about the world, we should dismiss them. But I believe they preached reality. Love as the basis of the state has never been tried. Einstein called our moral leaders geniuses in the art of living. Do you hear that? That's our scientist, our most, call it pragmatic, person who saw into reality and said our moral leaders were geniuses in the art of living. The art of living is relationships, how we do business with each other, how we walk, how we create infrastructure. Those guys were geniuses. Why don't we look to them to see how we walk in the world? Not just on Sunday, but every day. They're looking for facts down here. You had a question. Yes. Thanks, you guys. Kevin, good luck on that test. <laughs> good luck, man. Your friend has to leave. Yeah, blame it on him. We, uh, goodbye. Oh, you're coming up. Kevin's coming up. You're getting close. Yes, you want to take the mic? Oh, sure. Thank you so much for a beautiful film. And now that you've put everything that you've kind of learned um, out there, what has been the most surprising thing that has come back to you? Uh, so now that I put everything out there, what's the most surprising thing that's come back to me? Well, it shouldn't surprise me, but so much love. But I say it's surprising because you understand a principle. You give love. You give something of yourself. And you, you know, the law says something will come back. What has come back has been unbelievable to me. I, I could, right now, I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. By that, I don't mean I'm good. I mean, I'm good. If it, if it happens to me tonight, I'm good. I'm good, right? And, and the fact that I'm now friends with people that all my life, I was so moved. Their, 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 their poetry, for example, Coleman Barks, changed me, opened me up, actually pushed the false self, Kevin, aside and opened me up to who I really was. Coleman is now a friend. The poet Mary Oliver is now a friend. Right, Daniel Ladinsky, who writes the Hafiz poetry, is now someone that I correspond with. And they all came to me. So I tell you, if you take a step into your own heart, you will not believe how the world responds. Not that it doesn't meet you with challenges, but when you take a step into your own heart, the beauty you find is so infinitesimally greater than you can even imagine. Let's have a funeral for me right now. <laughs> I feel like this is a good time. Maybe some of us could eulogize me. He was a good man. He needed a hairdresser, but he was a good man. Yes, 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 you. Would I happen to be a vegetarian? I'm, I'm crazier than that. I'm a friggin' vegan. Oh my gosh. Technically, I can't even breathe the air because there's microbes that are alive and I'm killing them right now. Um, but yeah, I'm a vegan, yes. And I, that was part of the journey. And uh, uh, I, I didn't set out to be a vegetarian or a vegan, but just, it just felt like the right thing for me to do. And, and I feel really great. I feel fantastic. Are you a vegetarian by any chance? You're a vegetarian. All right, we're going to get you down the road there. <laughs> you cheese killer. You're a cheese killer. You are a cheese killer. Um, no, you know what happened is I was a vegetarian for a while. And I, first of all, I was a vegetarian for a while. Then I got the concussion. And then doctors told me a lie. You can't get enough protein. Your, your brain will never heal. So I went back and ate mostly fish and some chicken for a while. But that was a lie, as I now discovered. I became a vegetarian a while ago um, after my, my, my concussion basically healed. I'm about 98%. Um, so I was a vegetarian, and then I went out with a, a woman named Ellen DeGeneres, who's a friend, recently become a friend because she responded to this movie uh, and another movie I, I produced called Happy. Some of you may have seen Happy, Rocco Belk's wonderful movie about happiness. And I said, okay, Ellen, 
You got five minutes, you're a vegan. Tell me why I should be vegan. It took her about two minutes and I've been a vegan since then. So um, yeah, and that was a easy, much easier than going veg. How many vegetarians do we have in the room? Okay, okay. How many um, murders do we have in the room? I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, no judgment. I'm, I, I, no judgment. Everybody's, you know, everybody's on a path, and I think, I think right now as a species, we're, 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 we're finding our way, I think, to more plant-based diet, right? We're, we're some 80% water, and of course, vegetables are reflective of that, you know? And you see uh, species like the horse and the gorilla, and they're so strong, and their musculature is so incredible, and they eat plant-based diets. And I think as a species, we're going to get there uh, because we just can't sustain the populations we have with the amount of energy it takes to, to, uh, to you know, grow a pound of meat, if you will, to, to... Okay, yes, a lot, of, a lot of middle action here. Oh, wait a minute, there. okay, I'll get to you. You wait, okay, I know it's, you're awesome. We'll get to you in one second. Was, yes, ma'am, you had your hand up. Well, my plan is you. You're my plan for how it spreads faster. Seriously. Now, that may not be a very good plan, but that depends on how good you are. Because really, the plan is you. Tell someone, share it with one person, let them share it with two people. It takes 33 iterations, 33 iterations to get an idea all the way around the world. If you share it with two, they share it with two each, et cetera. It takes 33 steps, that's all. So our plan is you. Okay, now we're doing everything we can. We travel with the movie. We travel for free with the movie. We give the movie away for free all the time. Uh, we've been on television with the movie, as I said. And we have it up on, we're, we're giving it away online for free very soon. We're going to launch it on The Ellen Show. Uh, so soon you'll be able to tell your friends that for this week, it's given away for free. The Dalai Lama and I are Facebook friends, <laughs> right? Actually, no, he was the one guy. I, could, I got to, couldn't get to a few people that I wanted to talk to in the movie. I wanted more female energy in the movie, Vandana Shiva, a few others. I couldn't get to them for certain reasons. Um, but yes, there is collaboration, of course. I believe like draws like. So I have a beautiful community of people you know, that we help each other and we spread the word for each other. Louis Soyos, the director of The Cove, for example, won the Academy Award a few years ago. You remember The Cove? It was a difficult movie, but a, a movie that spread a lot of awareness about what we're doing to dolphin and other sea creatures in the ocean. Louis a dear friend. The great photographer, Chris Jordan. And we help each other. Chris has got a movie coming out about the plastification of the oceans. It's incredible, the footage that he has. You've got to see his film. We're in touch. Rocco Bellic, Fulke Terzani. I could name you tons. We're working together as best we can. Here's the difference. I don't freaking sweat about it. I never sweat about it. I believe in this organizing intelligence so strongly that I know that if I work hard and stay in my heart and do everything I can, the results are not up to me. This is where many of us go a little nutty. We think the results are up to us. There's a famous poem, and I can, let me see if I can get it right. It's a Hafez poem. He says, the difference between you and a saint, and by you I include myself, the difference between a regular person and a saint is, is think of life as a grand game of chess with the divine. And the divine makes an incredible move, it's checkmate. The saint knows to throw up his hands, smiling and say, I surrender, where the rest of us think we have a thousand beautiful moves left. I have thrown up my hands and said, I surrender. I surrender. Now, that doesn't mean I don't work. I would venture to say there's virtually nobody in this room that works as hard as I do. Maybe you tie me, but I don't think you beat me because I'm constantly working because I don't consider it work. I consider it my life. You know how much money I'm getting to be here tonight? Nothing. Do you know how much I'm getting to be here tonight? Everything, right? So it's my life, so I never stop working. Yes, you have a little bit of a Nazi to your uh, question, by the way. <laughs> there's, there, there's a little bit of a fear factor with you. So, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, let me get to her and then. Did you have, did I, I'm sorry. Did you want to, what's that? You want, do you have a question? Yes. Yes, the, the Gita. Here go the stars of the evening. Hang on one second. They're taking off on us. Are the girls leaving? Is this a curfew? Are you, like, are you putting them under house arrest? What is the deal with you? I'm kidding. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank the stars of the evening. Let's thank the stars of the evening. <laughs> Thanks so much. See you guys. We love you. Thank you for being here. Don't worry about your grades. I know you're never going to hear that again, but don't worry. Don't worry. So I seem to be. Yes. Beautiful. I love that. Beautiful. Well, you're, there's a kind of a couple questions that I'm hearing in you. Uh, how, how does Kevin start sooner down the path? How does Kevin start sooner down the path? And then you're out. Five minutes. I like to be honest with everyone. Five minutes. All right. Here we go. Changes now. Four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes. Okay. Um, so one more question after this, and that's it. Um, so uh, first of all, despair is you're, you're preaching a very, where'd you go? There you are. You're preaching a very different message than society, right? What hurts you blesses you, right? All the mystics know that. So uh, what is the uh, 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 definition of Sufism uh, taught by a great sheikh? Sufism is the mystical sect of the Muslim faith. It's the feeling of joy when sudden disappointment comes. Now, that's a radically different idea because the Sufi knows that from sudden disappointment, from despair, something is being born, right? That's why shit makes the best fertilizer, right? Things grow from shit, right? but we want all the shit to go away. We even have the school of thinking called the secret that if you get your thoughts right, everything's gonna be perfect. <laughs> You'll float off the planet and your bank account will be full and everything will be lovely, except it doesn't work because life is, exists in the belly of, of a paradox. And the paradox is we have to be empty to be full and to no pleasure you must feel pain. So growth is part of that paradox where we have to have trials Obstacles in every story help the lead character grow. So that's one question. And then you say, how does Kevin, how does Kevin grow sooner than maybe I, who took a while, and maybe some of us who take a while? That's why I'm here, to offer my journey. That's what all storytelling is about. I'm offering my story to Kevin to say, you can go down the path that I went down. Feel free. I have a feeling you'll have the same realizations that I will if you really feel, or you can look at my experience and maybe learn something from my experience. But I have no formula. Life created the formula. Last question. Oh, the, the, oh he, 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 okay. Go ahead, go ahead. We'll, I'll, I'll get you on the way out. Yes.
What is the most interesting place I have ever been to? Wow. Uh, this is going to sound weird, but Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, the most interesting place I have ever been to was actually not traveling outside, but seeing something from the inside. I know that sounds very strange, and you were looking for something, an answer like Kentucky, but... but the truth is, is that when you travel here, meaning into your own heart, you ever feel your own heart? You know, can you, by your own heart, I mean, can you feel what you love in life? What you love to, what do you love to do? What do you love? If you have a free day, what do you do? Do you play you like to play. You like to play sports. Beautiful. That's your heart. Right? Mom, mom, forgive me for this. I hope you always listen to that even when society tells you that you can't make a living and make a life out of the joy of play. Okay. But uh, that looks, the answer to your question is I have seen something by going in. That is the greatest place I've ever traveled. The second greatest place I've ever traveled is here to have this conversation with you. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for missing the World Series. Thank you for your open hearts, for listening, for your attention. Thank Emma for organizing this whole thing. Dear Emma. Thank you, Tom, for coming. We've really loved having you. So another hand for Tom. Also, there's a reason why you all came today. You either heard it through the internet, you got an email, you saw a flyer, and the people responsible for bringing you here are in the front row. So please get up Kelly, Tim, Timmy, and Mahim, and give them a hand. And we hope to see you again soon at some of the events we're putting on with the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. We have a lot of really wonderful events coming up, which you can find out about on our website and get on our mailing list. And we hope to see you all soon. So have a great evening. Three-minute hug.